Hey guys, your brain's hurting yet? It's been quite a bit of content. Uh, I'll try and talk about something a little bit simpler than, than everyone else, but um, you know, I hope you did your homework because it'll help you understand some of the topics we're going to talk about. Uh, today, I'd like to talk to you about the design space of staking. To begin, We'll briefly cover the emergence of staking, and then we'll discuss where we think staking is going to evolve from here. In the beginning, there was Bitcoin, and it was good. <laughs> it was a breakthrough in trustless software and permissionless coordination. Satoshi developed proof of work, which is the civil resistance mechanism that still powers it today. But proof of work is expensive, and it's slow. And that caused developers to invent proof of stake to improve speed and improve cost. Teams like Cosmos, Tezos, and Solana quickly developed novel proof of stake blockchains that were more performant than Bitcoin or other proof of work blockchains at the time, like Ethereum before the merge. Within these proof of stake chains, there's this concept of staking. So what is the simplest form of staking? The simplest form of staking is you stake valuable tokens to have the right to produce blocks and secure the network, just like miners do when they solve hashes in proof of work. In exchange for securing the network, you have the right to create new tokens, just like miners do in proof of work. And one new behavior is you, you get slashed if you underperform or you misbehave. And this is a new component to proof of stake that didn't exist in proof of work. It's an element of risk, which is going to be very important. Needless to say, proof of stake has really taken off. Basically, no one is developing proof of work chains anymore, or even building on top of them. Developer activity is almost exclusively focused on proof of stake. So as people were waiting for the Ethereum merge, or the transition from Ethereum proof of work to proof of stake, they could stake their ETH, but they could not unstake it. And it wasn't clear when the merge would happen and when they would actually be able to unstake their ETH. So developers at Lido came up with this concept of liquid staking tokens, also commonly called LSTs, where users could deposit ETH into Lido's smart contract, and the contract chose to stake those tokens. In exchange, the users got a receipt token called STETH, and they could use STETH in DeFi while the underlying ETH remained staked. This chart shows the amount of ETH staked, and the pink arrow shows the merge. The people who staked before the merge did not know when they were going to be able to unstake. And that meant that LSTs had a ton of, of utility because they offered the ability to stake your ETH, but still be able to access liquidity if you really needed it. And that is why liquid staking tokens are most adopted on Ethereum compared to other layer one chains. It's a quirk of history due to indefinite staking duration while waiting for the merge. However, as staking evolves and becomes more sophisticated, we expect liquid staking tokens to take off on other proof of stake chains as well. Now that we know why liquid staking came to be, let's take a look at some of the consequences of it. Liquid staking, like STETH or GDOSOL, offer access to liquidity when regular stakers would have to wait in order to unstake. This is good, but STETH isn't ETH, and GDOSOL isn't SOL, and that means that if you need to sell your STETH, you will pay more slippage than if you were to sell more liquid ETH. 
Another major benefit is that stake pools can help select top performing validators to stake to and monitor them for ongoing performance. But this introduces some centralization risk that these protocols have taken steps to mitigate. So coming back to our timeline, even though Ethereum upgraded to proof of stake last year, the network's total throughput still wasn't enough to service demand. And that gave rise to something called layer twos. I'm sure you know, some of you have heard of this. Layer twos like Polygon issued their own tokens for economic security guarantees. But these tokens have less liquidity and less value than ETH. So developers at Eigenlayer came up with this concept called restaking that allowed staked ETH to also secure layer twos. So what is restaking? Restaking enables staked ETH to be used as crypto economic security for protocols other than base Ethereum or layer one Ethereum. And in exchange, those stakers get the L2 fees. An ETH staker can choose which roll-up sequencers or which L2s to restake to. So why would someone do this? Why would a user restake their ETH? Well, they generate more staking rewards by securing more networks with the same capital. Why would L2s want restaking ETH rather than just have their own token? Well, staking provides a quick way to bootstrap economic security because ETH is more valuable and more liquid than any newer L2 token. It's important to remember the security provided by proof of stake is a function of how costly slashing is. And so L2s with restaked ETH will be more secure than L2s secured by their own token. A more secure L2 or a more secure chain is more attractive for developers and it's more attractive for users. So that's why L2s would want to do this. But an interesting consequence is this means you do not need L2 tokens. They don't need to exist if restaking works. It is important to note that there is a risk uh, that restaking can introduce. If the, st if the same ETH is restaked to many layer twos, then slashing some of that restaked ETH could affect the security of many L2s at the same time and have a cascading effect through the ecosystem. We talked about liquid staking, and we expect that liquid staking pools will also manage restaking. Just like liquid staking pools today select validators based on performance and risk, we expect these liquid staking pools to select roll-up sequencers to restake to based on performance and risk. This increases the utility of liquid staking pools. If a liquid staking pool also manages restaking, it is also managing more risk. And as Spencer talked about about 20 minutes ago, we believe that protocols don't capture value, DAOs manage risk. Because the liquid staking pools are managing more risk in this version of the world, they can charge more and have higher margins in a sustainable economic equilibrium. So what comes after restaking? Let's go back to our timeline. Uh, we believe that the next evolution of staking is something we call long-term staking. Current proof-of-stake protocols can suffer the equivalent of a run on the bank if too many stakers unstake at once. If too many stakers unstake at once, the chain can have stability and security issues. And we think that long-term staking will mitigate this risk to make networks more stable and more secure. Today, all staking is kind of analogous to demand deposits. Obviously not a bank, but similar concept. And we have a list of unbonding periods up here for various major chains. 
We have, you know, Sol at two to three days. We have something like Aptos at 30. And Ethereum actually has an interesting variable uh, system where the more people are trying to unstake, the longer you will have to wait to unstake. They have a queue that builds up. And this is a disaster waiting to happen. First come, first serve unbonding is like a bank run waiting to happen. At the first sense of trouble, it makes sense for you to unstake your ETH so you don't get stuck behind a growing unstaking queue. Networks like Solana with a defined unstaking period have the same problem too. The network can have too many stakers unstake all at once and very quickly. And in fact, we've seen this. In the wake of the very painful FTX debacle, we saw a ton of soul unstake. Remember, staked tokens secure proof of work chains, or pr proof of stake chains. When the amount and the value of staked tokens falls rapidly, that can be extremely risky for chain stability and chain security as validators drop offline. Users don't get the same transaction guarantees they're used to, and the whole thing could unravel. Thankfully, Solana was able to survive this test, but we can do better. So introducing long-term staking. We coined this in a blog post I published with Vishal from our investment team in August earlier this year. Long-term staking promotes network security and stability by permitting stakers to have a higher staking rate in exchange for a longer staking lockup. Basically, users can specify how long they are willing to lock up their tokens, and if they choose a longer period, they'll have the opportunity to generate more tokens because they're providing more value to the protocol. This represents a paradigm shift in how we think layer ones will think about staking. If a chain has long-term staking, chain security is more certain because long-term stakers literally could not unstake in a crisis. This will give more certainty to validators and other chain stakeholders about the security and the stability of the network. During periods of crisis, having continuity and having certainty can be the difference between success and failure. Long-term staking also incentivizes stakers to be longer-term oriented. And as a very beneficial side effect, long-term staking also introduces a brand new, very powerful DeFi primitive. A lot of you in the audience today have a background in traditional finance, and everyone in traditional finance is familiar with this concept of a yield curve. In extremely simple terms, a yield curve indicates people's risk tolerance over time. Lower risk tolerance typically leads to a steeper yield curve, where long-term rates are much higher than short-term rates. Higher risk tolerance in the market yields the opposite. There's a shallower yield curve, which means that the, the long-term rates are not much higher than short-term rates. Staking curves are conceptually similar to yield curves, but there are some key differences. Similarly to yield curves, we expect the steepness of staking curves to vary based on people's risk tolerance, and the market's risk tolerance at that time. So let's illustrate this DeFi primitive with three examples. Meet Alice, Bob, and Kathy. They have different time horizons and different perspectives. In the status quo, they all have to stake with the same terms, and they all generate the same staking rate regardless of these differences. Now, let's introduce long-term staking. The network allows users who commit to a longer staking period to generate more tokens. 
if the market's risk tolerance is low, then fewer tokens will be staked for the long term. And that means that the staking curve will be very steep, and long-term stakers will have the opportunity for a much higher staking rate than short-term stakers. Now, let's look, at an, let's look at an example where the opposite happens. In this example, more of the market is willing to stake for the long term. There's more risk tolerance in the market. So this causes the staking curve to be shallower. A staking curve is a fundamental DeFi primitive, which allows a DeFi ecosystem to determine the cost of capital over time. You can imagine a borrow lend protocol like an Aave or a margin fi offering fixed term, fixed rate borrows based on the staking curve. This is similar to how traditional lenders base their lending rates based on the yield curve. Another critical benefit of staking curves is improved liquidity. As the market risk tolerance changes, the steepness of the staking curve changes, as we illustrated through some of these examples. And traders can speculate on the slope of the staking curve, similarly how, to how they speculate on the slope of yield curves in traditional financial markets. This creates more trading volume and therefore more liquidity. For more details on how some of the specific mechanics of long-term staking work and how some of these numbers work, I would encourage you to read our blog post on the subject, which was part of the homework for today. So in summary, we see that staking design is going to become more sophisticated. We see liquid staking, we see restaking, also managed by liquid staking pools, we see long-term staking as the next primitive, and staking curves, once again, likely managed by liquid staking pools. And what we're seeing at a macro level is that crypto as a industry is speed running the lessons of the traditional financial system that took TradFi two centuries to learn, crypto is learning in a decade. Rehypothecation, term structures, yield curves, and other TradFi primitives will be reimagined and re-implemented in crypto. All right, thank you everyone. And now I'll hand it over to Kristen from the Blockchain Association.